Welcome to the Ortho Joe Show, a joint production of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Ortho Evidence. In our world, orthopedic research is king, and current topics from our respective publications are analyzed weekly. Here is Mohit Bhandari from Ortho Evidence and Mark Swinkowski from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, good morning, Mo. Good morning. We are sitting, I uh, think you and I, in uh, different countries and different provinces and states, but with equally warm winters. And uh, I know that you really like to improve your mental capacity by <laughs> cutting holes in ice and uh, diving into ice water. Right. So I think right. you're going to have to hold off on that for a bit. Not sure how you can comp it. Maybe cold showers. Is that how you do it? Well, I, I can tell you in Canada with the weather, it's more like a hot springs than it is a cold uh, plunge right now. It's pretty warm. It's we're about plus 10 degrees Celsius right now, December 26. So that's pretty, it's pretty atypical for us. Yeah. And we set a record here in the Twin Cities yesterday for a uh, high temperature on Christmas Day at uh, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Just crazy. Yeah. But we have the whole wonderful world of ortho joe to be thankful for and it uh, brightens up our day whether it's warm or cold or wet or dry so <laughs> i've got my i've got my coffee in my mug you're i will see the challenge is i'm going to be having my coffee in my mug post post podcast but that tells you how much i'm enjoying the late evenings as i'm getting up later than i should be but oh. i will be enjoying that for this podcast i oh. promise you yeah, good. It is the holidays, so you're is, you're, you're, you're well excused. Okay, good. Yeah. So I wrote you an email the other day throw, uh, telling you I was throwing you a curveball. And I was looking through the most recent edition of the journal, and it dawned on me that you and I, in two years of doing these podcasts, we have never, to my recollection anyway, which sometimes is subject to concern, uh, discussed a basic science manuscript. And I know for a fact that in your lengthy academic career that you yourself, even though a lifelong clinical researcher, have participated in basic science work, as have I. One that comes to mind is a uh, animal study that actually your colleague Emil Schimich and I did in a sheep model on reamed versus unreamed tibial nails and what it does to blood flow and mechanical healing and things like that. And that I believe was helpful to you when you were writing the grants uh, for oh. the sprint study. So there is some value uh, in it. And that's what I want to talk about today, yeah. if that's okay. And, and, oh, yeah. and, and well. since, since you're interested in going into cold water, uh, what <laughs> I found uh, in this most recent edition was a very interesting manuscript on the loads across hip and knee during swimming. Uh, this comes from Zhao et al. from the Charité in Berlin. I, I believe you've been there. I, I certainly have been to the Charité. Great academic institution with both clinical and basic research. But what they did was they took six patients who have instrumented hip prostheses and five who have instrumented knee prostheses, and they measured the forces across the joint in the standard crawl stroke, freestyle, and in breaststroke. And they measured the joint contact forces and found that uh, both hip and knee were increased during the crawl stroke. But the medial force at the knee, of course, was uh, highest with the breaststroke, which makes sense because you're producing a valgus stress across the knee. And that the loads can be as high as 179% of body weight. So an interesting study, well done. But what are your thoughts, first of all, in this particular study? And then on, on the role of basic science as a, as a card-carrying master clinician, clinical research. Yeah. So let me first start off by, by, by sharing that story, which is, you know, when we were, uh, boy, it would have been mid-1990s writing the grant for the REAM versus non-REAM tibial nailing trial, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first thing you do in any grant is you, you're requested to do a couple of things. One is, you know, what's been done? What's the rationale? What's your hypothesis, et cetera? But also, what's the scientific rationale for why you would do something? And, you know, biomechanical studies, uh, sort of the preclinical studies, were hugely important um, in, you know, building that, um, you know, biomechanical rationale, but also just the overall biological rationale as to why one particular implant 
uh, might be superior to another. You know, in in in, in the area of uh, whether it's forces or strength or potential future complications. So, you know, for that, pro hugely, hugely invaluable uh, from that perspective. When you look at the work um, you've presented, again, hugely valuable insights around force distribution. The question that always asked is, okay, uh, if we know this, what would be the next thing we would do? Uh, would we change, you know, uh, the way we manage patients based on that? Would we change swimming patterns? Would we uh, offer different guidance? The same way you might say, Mark, um, which you're familiar with too, which is, you know, um, there have been, I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of biomechanical comparisons of one implant construct right. against another implant construct. And the question always is, you know, do they lead to individuals changing practice? Um, you can be highly conservative and say, you know, I'll use a double plating technique versus a single plating as an example, right? But um, but the real question is, is how do you, how do you go forward with that? Um, David Sackett, who I know you're aware of, would have said back, you know, in the in the hierarchy of evidence. And again, you know, um, I always say it's it's just it's it's just the way it's been presented. Doesn't mean it's right or it's wrong, but that's the way over time it's it's been presented as this hierarchy of evidence in which you've got, you know, right at the top you've got the um, a clinical trial, uh, the randomization being the most powerful too. But you know, at the level five level. It's often opinion. Now, people get offended when they say, well, opinion and preclinical research should not be the same mindset, right? Because, but all of that is about hypothesis generation, biological plausibility. So they've put, um, you know, biomechanical studies in the level five. So if you believe that, um, you know, sort of that clinical hierarchy of evaluating a treatment, then the bigger question would be is what will we have to do from this important study that's been published in JVJS to further that into into imminently change practice. And I guess it gets back to the individual. Um, I suspect there may be some who read this will just say, that's all I need. Um, and by the way, can you remind me, was there any specific guidance um, in the conclusions or the or the paper around what they were, uh, what these results would suggest? Was there a change in any sort of uh, treatment, uh, treatment meaning uh, post-operative uh, activity or swimming in general? Yeah, so let me just read the conclusions to you. Swimming is a safe and low impact activity, particularly recommended for patients who undergo total hip or total knee arthroplasty. Hip and knee joint loads are greater with high, higher swimming velocities and can be influenced by swimming styles. Nevertheless, concrete suggestions to patients who undergo arthroplasty on swimming should involve individual considerations. So, I think what they're getting at is that, you know, we have been counseling patients who undergo arthroplasty for forever that it, the swimming is safe because it's a low impact activity and builds muscle strength, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this uh, work really documents that it is safe uh, uh, and uh, the moments aren't overwhelmingly large and are highly unlikely to lead to increased risk of loosening. So it, yeah. it's it's more of a, a patient counseling, I think, advance. And, and if anything, it seems like it's more confirming current practice. In other words, it's giving people more assurance that there's a biological rationale as to why swimming doesn't seem to lead to any untoward events. Now, let's let's put it the other way. Yeah. Suppose there were a whole bunch of problems happening with swimming. Um, mm -hmm. You wouldn't be surprised to see that there may be some, you know, different results, let's say biomechanically. And so what typically happens, I think, and where the real challenge always with, with preclinical research is, the extremes often are going to be shown, right? If it's an extremely, yeah. if, it's, if it's an overt thing, um, like, you know, for example, in the unream nail, the distal locking screws were breaking. Well, that was like, it was visible. So, and biomechanically, you could show that, okay, that was going to be a win-win. Um, when it's something that's very safe and there's not much that's going to win-win, what do you do in that 80% of the time where it's a little bit more nuanced. Like, let's say, what is the implication of a one millimeter step off or a two millimeter step off in a joint, you know, when you're doing a reconstruction, what does that have implications on? You can have a super conservative, say it should be perfect anatomical reconstruction, or there'll be some sort of long-term consequence because it sort of intuitively makes sense. But if you look at study after study, they don't always show that because there's as soon as you get into a clinical trial, it's a bit more, um, there's a lot more noise to deal with. So some can argue that, you know, it's never a pure environment, but also it's the it's the most way to, to evaluate the effectiveness. If something's going to work, you got to look at it, what happens in the real world. 
And so it's a it's a fascinating thing. The one thing I will share with you, though, I did take a moment to look up if anyone else had done any work on this area, Mark. And um, there is a paper. Uh, I think it was originally presented, or a version of it seemed to be presented uh, at the Orthopedic Trauma Association some years ago, um, and it was subsequently published in, um, or at least in print, in 2022. Um, and bottom line is, in, and this, this is in the European Journal of Orthopedics and Traumatology, what they say is that on uh, this particular paper, they conduct a systematic review um, to find randomized trials that were testing a research question that was initially based on some sort of biomechanical study. So you can imagine a host okay. of, of studies I've looked at, you know, two plates versus a single plating, a double plating technique versus single, and then they're evaluating whether it's superior. So based on that alone, they found 21 orthopedic RCTs, um, and then they looked at whether there was an association. But just not, you know, without me telling you the results, maybe you've already read the paper. What do you think they would have found? Uh, I would have suggest. Okay. I guess uh, that uh, in most instances, the clinical findings of the biomechanical outcomes did not match. Uh, yes, and my, my, the reason why I say that is that because patient factors often dominate, um, not the least of which is the uh, perception of pain, uh, et cetera. So. Right. And so it's exactly as you said it. I, I think you could have written in their conclusion, which is they basically said um, these, you know, the, the corresponding biomechanical studies associated and this corresponding randomized trials found no association between superior biomechanical properties of a given orthopedic treatment and improved clinical outcomes. Um, they also said, which I thought was an important message, favorable biomechanical properties alone uh, should not be the primary reason for selecting one treatment over other. Going to the point of saying, I think is all, all, all careful uh, research does it's you know it's it's individual it's patient specific and it's also condition specific and ultimately you want to look at the broad totality of your insight and information about a particular you know tri uh, treatment or therapy so I, I mean I don't think that um, that the way you know at, at least um, scientists you know doing biomechanical research are are shaping the, the the literature I don't think there's any sort of um, you know um, misrepresentation of what uh, you know the work isn't what it is. And I think of what it's saying is take this as another piece of that of that overall puzzle. So in the paper you just presented, uh, it's a nice confirmatory piece of that puzzle. And that I think helps a lot because it gives more reassurance that there is a biomechanical rationale for the way patients are, you know, in terms of their rehabilitation or their activities post-surgery. So I think uh, to sort of uh, wrap up the, the whole uh, a discussion regarding basic science. I think you and I would likely agree that basic science studies remain incredibly important for hypothesis building uh, and uh, generating data that can be subsequently evaluated in higher um, quality research designs with patients. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't mean that there are any less or uh, uh, valuable than uh, high high quality clinical research. Uh, there's they're an important building block, uh, and we need to continue to uh, evaluate these submissions and and publish them where the their own research design is high quality. Did I get it right? I think you're right, bang on. I think high quality scientific research will only allow. Um, for high quality uh, rationales that can drive clinical trials, which hopefully, to your point, will be equal high quality. And that's it, right? We're all trying to uh, limit bias in everything we do and try to come up with rationales. You can imagine, right, um, that uh, a poorly designed uh, preclinical study that leads to an errant bio biological rationale will lead to a probably errant design of a clinical study thinking that, you know, something is or isn't the way it is. And so it's really important to have scientists and, and clinical researchers working together on this. Yeah, and your use of the word limiting, uh, words limiting bias uh, brings up one point that I often make when uh, discussing this with, with audiences that oftentimes in basic science, uh, the, the individuals conducting the research uh, don't use important methods of blinding assessment. Uh, and, and, bl and blinding the, uh, the, the conduct of the biomechanical study 
uh, with uh, to try to limit bias. Uh, it, it is it is far more frequent, I find, in basic science studies that basic blinding of outcome assessment is not used um, compared to clinical research, which I think is improving across the board. Um, not sure if you would agree with that. Um, yeah, no, I, I I think you know. I mean, there are just sim- there are some simple truths, right? That if I have a preconceived notion and I'm the operator of any device that may be testing something or evaluating something, if it's under a microscope, I am highly, highly influenced by my own perception. So limiting the degree of those perceptions or biases is going to be important wherever you do. Uh, And the more we can be transparent about that, Mark, I think the better. Yeah, that's good. That's a nice way to end our discussion, but I I want to Produce a warning. I, I think the colleagues at Charité are now going to be investigating the hip and knee loads in individuals who are chopping holes in ice and jumping in. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, manuscript published, and uh, and I hope it doesn't discourage you from that important activity when the ice returns. Mm. Yes, it, it will be no ice chopping at, at any time soon right now with the way that the weather is. Uh, although, you know what? I am actually looking forward to snow. I'm I'm hopeful that snow will fall. But at that point, all I can do at this point is hope. That's all I can do. So <laughs> me as well. Well have a have a good day. Enjoy your, your coffee and your ortho Joe mug and Absolutely. we'll talk again soon. And if I could Mark, if I can just wish you uh, a very, very happy end to the 2023 and we'll be, I guess, seeing everybody again, um, the team here at Ortho Joe and thanking Carl, Allen, and Christina, who have been hugely helpful to us. I, I know you think um, as highly as I do, everyone on the team, uh, but just wishing everyone a nice end to 2023, a reflective end, and we'll be back supercharged for 2024, I'm sure. Excellent way to, to end the uh, podcast. And uh, my thanks as well to these wonderful individuals who do all the work and you and I just chat <laughs> and enjoy it. Yes. All right. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, team. Thank you, everyone. See you next year. You too.